It's a contentious case because Dr. John Bodkin Adams wasn't actually found guilty of murder or professional negligence. Despite his own death, there's still debate over whether Bodkin Adams was a murderer or a euthanatized. While some see him as a precursor to the medical mass murderer Dr. Harold Shipman, others see him as a mercy killer when painkillers were the only way to relieve terminal suffering. Dr. John Bodkin Adams was a general practitioner in Eastbourne, a seaside town in Sussex. Irish loner, he seemed unconcerned about inheriting and getting gifts from his wealthy, elderly patients. The middle-aged doctor wasn't an outstanding physician, but his elderly patients trusted him for his compassion and consideration. Despite this, other aspects of his approach caused concern, mainly his tendency to use dangerous drugs and a pathological interest in his patients' wills, as some critics have described it. General Practitioner John Bodkin Adams was born on July 4, 1983, has more than 160 patients who died under suspicious circumstances. In 1957 he was tried and controversially acquitted of killing a patient. However, another count of murder was withdrawn. Despite growing up in an austere Protestant sect, Adams remained a member of the Plymouth Brethren his entire life. Samuel, his dad, was a preacher in the local congregation, even though he was a watchmaker by trade. He also loved cars, something he passed on to John. He was 39 when he married Ellen Bodkin, 30, in Randallstown, Northern Ireland, in 1896. Their first son, John, was born in 1899, followed by William Samuel in 1903. In 1914, Adams's father died of a stroke, and four years later, William died from influenza. At 17, Adams matriculated at Queen's University Belfast. He was viewed as a plotter and lone wolf by his lecturers, and after a year of missing classes, probably tuberculosis, he failed to qualify for honors in 1921. He got a job as an assistant houseman at Bristol Royal Infirmary, thanks to Arthur Rendell Short. Despite spending a year there, Adams didn't do well. He applied for a job at a Christian practice in Eastbourne on Short's recommendation. Adams moved to Eastbourne in 1922, where he lived with his mom and cousin Florence Henry. A patient, William Mawhood, loaned him £2,000 to buy a house in Trinity Trees, a posh neighborhood. At mealtimes, Adams would often invite his mother and cousin to the Mawhood's home. Also, he started charging items to their accounts at local stores without their permission. And he took a 22 karat gold pen from her bedroom dressing table when Mr. Mawhood died in 1949, aged 89. He never returned to see her again. By the mid-1930s, gossip about Adams's unconventional methods had started. He admits in a newspaper interview from 1957 that he received the first of many anonymous postcards in 1935. That's the year Adams inherited £7,385 from a patient, Mrs. Matilda Whitten, whose estate amounted to $11,465. Her relatives contested her will, but the court upheld it. Adams stayed in Eastbourne throughout the war, even though he wasn't considered for a pool system where GPs cared for colleagues who were called up. In 1941 he got a diploma in anesthetics, and his mom died in 1943. Edith Alice Morell, a wealthy widow, was one of Adams's patients. The girl had a brain thrombosis, a stroke, was partially paralyzed, and had severe arthritis. She moved to Eastbourne in 1949 and was supervised by Adams. He gave her heroin and morphine for her cerebral irritation and to help her sleep. The 10 months before her death, Adams had given Morell a total of 1,629 grains of barbiturates, 1,928 grains of sodormid, 164 grains of morphia, and 140 grains of heroin. And between the 7th and 12th of November 1949 alone, she was given 40 grains of morphia and 39 grains of heroin. Despite any tolerance, that dose would have been enough to kill her. Morell had made several wills. In some of them, Adams received large sums of money or furniture, in others, he was not mentioned. On August 24, 1949 she added a codicil saying that Adams would receive nothing. Three months later, on November 13, 1950, she died of a stroke at the age of 81, according to Adams. Despite Morell's clause, the doctor received £78,000 from Morell's estate, 
a Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost. Gertrude Hewlett, another Adams patient, died on July 23, 1956 at age 50. Since the death of her husband four months earlier, she had been prescribed sodium barbitone and sodium phenobarbitone. She told Adams a few times she wanted to die. She probably took an overdose on the 19th and was found in a coma the following day. As Adams was unavailable, a Dr. Harris attended. Adams arrived later that day. Adams didn't mention her depression or medication once. It was most likely a cerebral hemorrhage, partly because the pupils were contracted. However, this is also a symptom of morphine or barbiturates poisoning. Additionally, her breathing was shallow, typical of an overdose. Heavy breathing usually goes along with cerebral hemorrhage. On the 20th, Dr. Shera took a spinal fluid sample. When he saw her, he asked if her stomach contents should be checked for narcotic poisoning. Adams and Harris both said no. A urine sample showed Hewlett had 115 grains of sodium barbitone in her body, twice the fatal dose. After her death, the results weren't received until the 23rd. At Hewlett's inquest, the coroner said poisoning should have been considered earlier. On the 22nd, Adams admitted there was a possibility of barbiturate poisoning and gave Hewlett an antidote, 10 cc of megamide. According to the inquest, the recommended dose was 100 cc to 200 cc. Adams even checked with a colleague at the Princess Alice Hospital in Eastbourne, who told police he had told him to give 1 cc every 5 minutes. Then he gave Adams 100 cc of megamide. The coroner described Adams's treatment as merely a gesture. He also wondered why Adams only gave oxygen to the patient hours before she died. Hewlett was cyanosed, blue, according to the nurse. Adams said, there didn't seem to be a need for it. Coroner asked why there was no intravenous drip. Adams replied, she wasn't sweating. She hadn't lost any fluid. But the nurse said she sweated a lot from the 20th until her death. In the inquest, it was determined that Hewlett committed suicide. The coroner told the jury not to find that Adams' criminal negligence caused Hewlett's death. Before the trial in 1957, the DPP's office compiled a list of patients treated with megamide and daptazole for barbiturate poisoning at St. Mary's Hospital in Eastbourne between May 1955 and February 1957. There were 17 patients listed, 15 had recovered, and six had been in the first half of 1956 before Hewlett died. Most of them were on a drip, and some took a higher dose than Hewlett. Adams had been an anesthetist at this hospital for one day a week since 1941 when he qualified. DPP assumed he must have heard about these cases and their success. Why didn't he think about an overdose, and why was the treatment delayed and inaccurate? The pathologist called Adams before Hewlett died to schedule a postmortem. The pathologist was shocked and accused Adams of extreme incompetence. In a will dated 14th of July, Hewlett left her 1954 Rolls Royce to Adams. Adam changed the car's registration on 8th of December, then sold it on the 13th. Some suspicious cases were in August 1939 while Adams was treating Agnes Pike. Her solicitors were concerned about the amount of hypnotic drugs he was giving her, so they asked a different doctor, Dr. Matthew, to take over her treatment. Matthew examined her in Adam's presence but didn't find anything wrong. The patient was also deeply under the influence of drugs. Then Adams gave Mrs. Pike an injection of morphia during the exam. Adams said he did it because she might be violent. Matthew discovered Adams banned all her relatives from seeing her. After eight weeks of Dr. Matthew's care, Mrs. Pike was able to shop on her own again and had regained her full faculties. Amy Ward died on February 23, 1950. Prior to her death, Adams banned her from seeing her relatives. Adams said he wasn't a beneficiary of her will on the cremation form, but she left him 1,000 pounds of her 8,993 pounds estate. Annabelle Kilgore died on December 28, 1950, age 89. Adams had been treating her since July when she had a stroke. After Adams started giving her sedatives, she went into a coma on 23rd of December. Mrs. Kilgore left Adams 200 pounds and a clock. Julia Bradnam died on May 11, 1952 at the age of 85. The previous year Adams offered to check her will at the bank with her. After looking at it, he pointed out that she hadn't given her beneficiaries addresses, and it needed to be rewritten. She wanted to leave her house to her adopted daughter, but Adams said it'd be better if she sold it and then gave the money to whomever she wanted. She did that. In the end Adams got 661 pounds.
Adams held this patient's hand and chatted to her on one knee while attending to her. The day before Bradnam died, she was doing housework and going for a walk. She woke up feeling sick the following day. Adams got a call and came to see her. Then he gave her an injection and said, it will be over in three minutes. I'm sure it was. Adams then left the room after saying, I'm afraid she's gone. On December 21, 1956, Bradnam was exhumed. Adams said Bradnam died of a cerebral hemorrhage on his death certificate. Her brain was examined. However, the rest of the body wasn't able to tell what killed her. Adams, the executor, had also put a plate on Bradnam's coffin stating she died on May 27, 1952. Julia Thomas, 72, was being treated for depression by Adams. She called him Bobbums, after her cat died in early November. Adams gave her sedatives on the 19th so she'd feel better in the morning. She went into a coma the next day after taking more tablets. He told Thomas Cook on the 21st, Mrs. Thomas has promised me her typewriter, I'll take it now. She died at 3 a.m. the following day. Hilda Neal Miller, 86, dies in a guest house where she lived with her sister Clara. They hadn't received their post for many months and were cut off from their families. When Hilda's friend Dolly Wallace asked Adams about her health, he answered with medical terms she didn't understand. Phyllis Owen, Hilda's nurse, saw Adams pick up objects in the room, examine them, and put them in his pocket. He arranged Hilda's funeral and burial site himself. Clara Neal Miller died on February 22, 1954, aged 87. When he saw her Adams would lock the door for up to 20 minutes at a time. Clara told Dolly Wallace he was helping her with personal matters like pinning on brooches and adjusting her dress. She liked his fat hands. She also looked like she was high. It was the coldest February in a long time, so Adam sat with her in her room for 40 minutes. A nurse entered, unnoticed, and found Clara's bedclothes all off. Over the foot rail of the bed, her nightgown up around her chest, and the window open top and bottom, while Adams read to her from the Bible. Hannam later confronted Adams about this, and Adams said, the person who told you that doesn't know why I did it. She left Adams 1,275 pounds, and he charged her estate an extra 700 pounds after she died. He was the only executor. Adams arranged her funeral, and only he and Mrs. Annie Sharp, the guesthouse owner, were there. Clara left her 200 pounds in her will. Start, speech R equals X slow and speech. Amy Ware's brother-in-law James Downs died on May 30, 1955. Four months ago, he'd broken his ankle and was in a nursing home. Adams gave him morphia, a sedative that made him forgetful. Adams gave his nurse, Sister Miller, a tablet to make him more alert on April 7th. Two hours later, a lawyer came to amend his will. Adam told the solicitor he was going to inherit $1,000. The lawyer changed the choice and returned two hours later with another doctor, Dr. Barkworth, who said the patient was alert. Dr. Barkworth got paid three guineas for his time. Nurse Miller told police Adams had said the senile downs earlier that April, now look Jimmy, you promised me. You would look after me, but you haven't even mentioned me in your will. I've never charged you anything. Twelve hours after Adams' last visit, Downs died after a 36-hour coma. Adams billed Downs estate £216 for his services but signed Downs' cremation form, saying he had no pecuniary interest in the death. Alfred John Hewlett died in 1956 at the age of 71. Gertrude Hewlett was his wife. After Adams's death, he went to a chemist for a 10cc bottle of hypodermic morphine solution containing 5 grains of morphine and for his prescription to be backdated to the previous day. Police thought Adams had given him morphine from his private supplies. Adams got £500 from Hewlett's will. Despite years of rumors and Adams being mentioned in at least 132 wills of his patients, an anonymous call from Eastbourne Police on July 23, 1956 led to an investigation into his death. The music hall performer Leslie Henson sent the letter to Adams, whose friend Gertrude Hewlett died unexpectedly while being treated by him. Two officers from the Metropolitan Police's murder squad took over the investigation from Eastbourne Police. On 17 August, the top detective at Scotland Yard, Detective Superintendent Herbert Hannum, solved the Teddington Towpath murders in 1953. He was assisted by Detective Sergeant Charles Hewitt, a junior officer. The investigation only looked at 1946 to 1956 cases. Of the 310 death certificates examined by Home Office pathologist Francis Camps, 
163 were deemed to be suspicious. Many of his patients got special injections that Adams wouldn't describe to the nurses. In addition, he used to ask the nurses to leave the room before giving injections. Hannum started having problems on 24th of August, the British Medical Association wrote to all doctors in Eastbourne, reminding them to be careful if they get questioned by the police. Hannum was not impressed, and the Attorney General, wrote to the BMA secretary, Dr. McRae, to try to get him to remove the ban. The impasse continued for months until on 8th of November. Manningham Buller met with Drive, McRae and, amazingly, passed him Hannum's 187-page report on Adams to convince him of the importance of the case. Dr. McRae took the report to the BMA president and got it back the next day. Most likely, he copied it and gave it to the defense. Dr. McRae then called doctors in Eastbourne himself and told the DPP that they didn't have any evidence to justify the charges. There were only two Eastbourne doctors who gave evidence to the police. Hannum and Pugh searched Adams' house under the Dangerous Drugs Act, 1951, on 24th of November. Adams was surprised, you won't find any here. Hannum then asked for Adams' dangerous drugs register. Adams' response was, I don't know what you mean. I don't keep a record. He hadn't kept a record since 1949. Adams slipped something into his pocket while he was searching. Harmon and Powell challenged him, and Adams showed them two morphine bottles. He said one was for Mrs. Annie Sharp, and another was for a Mr. Soden, who had died on September 17, 1956, though pharmacy records later showed Mr. Soden had never been prescribed morphine. Adams was subsequently convicted, after his main trial in 1957, of obstructing the search, concealing the bottles, and failing to keep a DD register. Later in the investigation, Adams told Hannum, It's not so bad to ease the passing of a dying person. Morell actually wanted to die. That can't be murder. A doctor can't be accused. In December, the rumors of homosexuality between a policeman, a magistrate, and a doctor started spreading. That's what Adams meant. Hannum gave the report of this info. Sir Roland Gwynne was the magistrate, mayor of Eastbourne from 1929 to 1931 and brother Rupert Gwynne, MP for Eastbourne from 1910 to 1924. Gwynne was Adam's patient who came every morning at 9 a.m. They went on a lot of holidays together and just came back from three weeks in Scotland. The police officer was none other than Eastbourne's chief constable, Richard Walker. Hannum didn't spend much time investigating this, despite homosexuality being illegal in 1956. However, Adam's memo shows how close he was to the power players in Eastbourne at the time. In 1955, Adams had become England's richest doctor, paying £1,100 in surtax alone in 1955. He said this when he heard the charges. Murder. Murder. Can you prove it was murder? I didn't think you could prove it was murder. She was dying in any event. As he was leaving Kent Lodge, he grabbed his receptionist's hand and told her, I'll see you in heaven. Hannum gathered enough evidence in at least four cases to warrant prosecution, Clara Neil Miller, Julia Bradnam, Edith Alice Morell, and Gertrude Hewlett. Adams was charged with two counts, the killings of Morell and Hewlett. The committal hearing was held in Lewis on January 14, 1957. Sir Roland Gwynne was the chairman, but he stepped down because of his friendship with Adams. On 24th of January, Adams was committed to trial after a five-minute deliberation. On March 18, 1957, the trial started at the Old Bailey. The next day, a new Homicide Act came into effect, making poisoning a non-capital crime. Adams still faces the death penalty if convicted. Adams was first tried for murdering Mrs. Morell. The defense convinced the jury that there was no proof of murder, much less a murder committed by Adams. A lot of the indictment was based on the testimonies of the nurses who cared for Mrs. Morell. None of the witnesses' evidence matched that of the others and only one of the prosecution's expert witnesses was willing to say that murder had definitely been committed, and Lawrence was able to show that he was not a reliable witness. Adams didn't show up as a witness, and the prosecution was not allowed to produce evidence from Gertrude Hewlett's case, and therefore, a nurse who had worked with Adams in caring for Hewlett could not be called upon to repeat her words. So Adams was found not guilty on April 15, 1957. 
There is considerable evidence to suggest that the trial was interfered with by outside forces. This vital evidence, eight nurses' notebooks, appeared in pretrial police records but disappeared before the trial started, robbing Sir Reginald Manningham Buller of the chance to see them. The defense gave him a copy of them on the second day of the trial. After the entire defense had the books, they were used to counter the evidence presented against Adams by the nurses who had initially written the notes. Even six years later, the notes are more reliable than the nurses' own memories. Despite his nickname, Sir Bullying Manor, the Attorney General didn't make any effort to investigate how those books got into their hands. He could be rude, but he didn't bluster. Yet his disagreeableness was so widespread, his persistence so interminable, and his obstacle so far-flung that sooner or later, you would ask yourself whether it was worth it, and then you were done. The defense has three explanations for getting the notebooks, the son of Mrs. Morell found them among her effects and gave them to Adams at his surgery. They were delivered anonymously to Adams after she died, they were found in the air raid shelter at the back of his garden. His solicitor later claimed they were found by the defense team in Adams's surgery shortly before trial. All this differs from the police records, however, in the list of exhibits for the committal hearing given to the DPP's office, they are clearly mentioned. The Attorney General, therefore, must have known they existed. Hannam's 187-page report was given by the Attorney General to the President of the British Medical Association, effectively the Doctors' Union in Britain, on November 8, 1956. This document, the prosecution's most valuable, was in the hands of the defense, which led the Home Secretary, Willem Lloyd George, to reprimand Manningham Buller, stating that such documents should not even be shown to members of Parliament. I can only hope no harm occurs since the disclosure of this document may cause me considerable embarrassment. The Attorney General had the power to charge Adams for Mrs. Hewlett's murder after the not guilty verdict on Mrs. Morell. But he chose not to offer any evidence by entering a nolle prosequi, historically only used if someone is too ill to stand trial. That wasn't the case with Adams. The presiding judge, Lord Justice Patrick Devlin, even called it an abuse of power in his post-trial book. The following year, Adams resigned from the National Health Service. He was convicted of eight counts of forging prescriptions, four counts of falsifying cremation forms, and three offenses under the Dangerous Drugs Act, 1951, and fined £2,400 plus costs. He was struck off the medical register on November 22, 1957. Adams sold his story to the Daily Express for 10,000 and sued several papers for libel. He stayed in Eastbourne despite being accused of killing 21 people. His friends and patients didn't generally share this belief, though. Roland Gwynne, however, distanced himself considerably from Adams after the trial. In 1961, Adams was reinstated as a general practitioner after two failed applications. It suggests his colleagues thought he wasn't guilty of murder, nor grossly negligent or incompetent. In August 1962, he applied for a visa to America, but he was turned down because of his dangerous drug convictions. Adams became president, and honorary medical officer, of the British Clay Pigeon Shooting Association. Adams slipped and broke his hip while shooting in battle, East Sussex, on June 30, 1983. He was taken to Eastbourne Hospital, but he got a chest infection and died on 4th of July. He left a will for £402,970. He kept getting legacies until the end. In 1986 The Good Dr. Bodkin Adams, a TV docudrama based on his trial, was produced starring Timothy West, 